Hello. Hi, Dana. How are you? Good. <laughs> oh, you're loading. Oh, there you are. Hey. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for your flexibility. So sorry for this confusion. There's two weeks out of the year where the U.S. and the U.K. don't ha line up time-wise with our time changes, and then it happens, and then we're back <laughs> at our distance. Oh, my gosh. I had no idea. I'm glad we could get it all uh, sorted for now. And Yeah, for uh, sure. Thank you so much for making t the time to chat. It's uh, I know your schedule is super busy. That's okay. That's okay. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much. So yeah, I wanted to briefly introduce myself. I'm Serena Nangia, and I'm a program and communications assistant at the Confucius Institute U.S. Center. I am so incredibly excited to speak to our guest today, Juliet Petrus. Um, or am I pronouncing that right? It's Petrus, but you know what? Petrus. Everybody all over the world says it a little bit differently, and I just kind of go with it. As long as, you know, as long as you know who, I, who I'm here talking to, that's all I care about. <laughs> Juliet Petrus. I, I no, I'm the same with my last name. Um, so we're so excited. She is a professional opera singer and was also a honoree for us in 2020. Um, her story is amazing, and I'm super excited for her to speak with us today. So would you do a little introduction of yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Juliet Petrus. I'm a professional opera singer originally from Michigan, uh, having done schooling in the United States. I'm also Italian. I happen to live in London right now. And um, to confuse matters, I'm a specialist in Chinese vocal music and spend about most of the time, usually spend about half my year uh, living and singing and teaching in China. That's amazing. It's when you said that in in your essay and also as you spoke at the gala, I just find I just that's so amazing that you get to spend so much time in China. Um, and I know you spent a lot of time traveling outside of the U.S. So how have you kind of grown within your professional career as well as personally like, traveling, spending time, especially in China? Um. Well, I mean, you know, opera is already such an international art form. It's not an American art form. It started in, and it started in Italy and then it sort of spread all over Europe and then eventually came to the United States and we took it and made it our own, making sort of musical theater. And, you know, there's, there's all that history there. But China, um, I, I guess China to me, of course, was a surprise in terms of my training and in terms of what I was hoping to accomplish as an opera singer. Uh, because, you know, you train as an opera singer in Italian and German and French and English, but, um, there was really no mention of Chinese at any point in my, in my, um, academic training. Um, and I have, you know, just of course, over time learned so much about the world and, and China in particular because of this opportunity that brought me to China now 10 years ago. Um, right. And, yeah, yeah. And it's, um, it's been just an exciting, it's just been, you know, the most exciting time of my life, honestly. Absolutely. I would love to hear more about I Sing. I know we, you mentioned it in your essay quite a bit and, and it has been 10 years now. I saw it was in 2011, which is amazing. Tell yeah. us more. Sure. So, um, I Sing, at the time it was called I Sing Beijing, and now is known as I Sing International Young Artist Program, which um, is currently stationed in Suzhou, China, outside of Shanghai. Um, it's a program that was designed by my mentor and the program director, uh, Tian Ha Zhang, who is a very famous, very well-known um, operatic base um, place, uh, based in New York and also in Beijing. He's from Beijing originally. And for many years, he and his wife, uh, Martha Liao, were devoted to helping to bring Chinese singers to the United States to help them study uh, opera and classical music in, in the West, uh, because that's what was done for him, and he wanted to return the favor. And then, 10 years ago, he came up with this, this idea to kind of, you know, turn it around and say, I want to bring Western singers to my homeland, and I want to teach them about my culture and history and music and language. Um, and so that's the program that that brought me to China in the first place. That was my first exposure to Chinese language. Before then, I didn't speak any Chinese at all. Um, and it was, you know, from them that I got this wonderful basis in this music and the language and the culture. 
and then proceeded to have you know be able to follow any opportunities that that came that came after that which was just awesome that's it's such a wonderful uh t- time to hear your your story especially with um how how relations between china and the us are right now but understanding like the people concept the human concept mm-hmm. is super important um and i know that your so your title of your ex- essay in 2020 um was the international language using song to connect China and the West. Um, I'd love to hear your perspective on, first of all, why you chose that topic, and second, how it's uh, um, writing the essay and, and your experiences has allowed you to explore culture and the cultural differences between China and the, U- uh, the US and the West. Well, it was easy to choose that subject because that, of course, has been, that's been my life for the past 10 years. <laughs> so, you know, if somebody asks you to talk about yourself, it ends up being pretty easy. Um, and, and, um, luckily for me, I've always sort of seen the, the work that I was doing in China and the United States and with Chinese music as something that is, um, that is based in in being an ambassador and being a way to to find a bridge between these two between these two um, cultures. So um, yeah, I mean, yeah, writing writing it was uh, actually, if anything, the hardest thing about writing it was keeping it to the amount of space that you guys needed me to keep it to. I kind of kept writing and writing and writing and writing. Um, yeah, I think yeah, it, it has been an education. Um, and I say that w- with no irony at all. I mean, it is, it has been absolutely the greatest education of my life to be able to go over there and to, you know, coming from, from the world perspective, a, a very young country with very young history to go and spend time in China and spend time and learning. Um, there's, I mean, I, you know, I've, I always have known that there's so much more that I don't know, but every time I go back there, I'm just like, oh. And I, now I want to look into this and now I want to learn about this. Um, and, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's my favorite place to be in the world. Um, wow. it makes, yeah. And, and it's of course been very difficult this past year. It's been over a year since I've been there. Um, and, uh, hopefully that will be remedied soon. Hopefully. Um, right. but, uh, yeah, I mean, just in terms of a, of a cultural education, Music to me is is the easiest way to reach people. Music and food, I should say. Music and food have that same ability to to really connect people in a way that um, really reaches them on a on a very visceral level. Mm. And and when you, as an outsider, somebody like myself who's an outsider who comes into a place like China, um, I think the biggest uh, way that that one can show respect for another country and another culture is if you the language of course to me that's 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 an integral part of it but also the music and the minute you speak music to somebody um a lot of other things seem to to fall away and dissolve i completely agree and i spent i was in choir for um all of high school and so we we sang in latin and italian and french and Mm -hmm. um even i think an african language and so those experiences i mean it is so phenomenal how um like even listening to you singing in china in mandarin chinese which i don't understand Mm -hmm. um the language is you really do feel what you are saying and especially with opera i find um well having watched your your um performances is that it's so um dramatic and uh you use a lot of like um body language and so even if you don't understand the words you still understand the story in some cons in some ways that's would you agree hope. yeah i mean that's the hope um uh you know the the mark of a good storyteller is is that you want to be able to reach you want to reach, be able to reach your audience if they can't see you, if they can't hear you, if they don't speak your language, you know, that you, you want to be able to find a way in to them. Um, so if it's using my voice, great. If it's using my body, like you said, great. Um, but ultimately it's, it's our, it's our burden as the artist who wants to be able to, of course, communicate with our audience and anybody who, who's listening. 
um, to tell the story and to and to make it our own because um, of course it doesn't matter that these poems or these songs are in Chinese the the experience is still uh, very international and very global absolutely and something else that you mentioned while you you were answering one of the questions was um, that it was difficult to write uh, your story in such a short <laughs> format do you have any recommendations I completely relate because you know your story is long but how do you how do you choose what's most important and share that that's a great question um so I just got done writing a book about singing in Mandarin um and have been writing a lot of stuff kind of academically recently on the subject and about myself because you know people People always want to know why, why it's the girl from Michigan who is promoting this music. Um, and for me, it's it's sort of like, you know, you have to get it all out on, on the page, right? The, the process of writing it, especially if you have people who are interested are applying for the the, um, the competition this year, the, um, you know, you've got to just get it all on paper. And then I think it starts to, you start to be able to kind of mold it into the shape that you need. And, um, and then you start to think to yourself, well, did I, Say that in the most direct way possible or is am I being a little too flowery or can I you know how can I how can I still make a good story and uh, tell you you know what the the truth of my my life has been and still um and so <laughs> on the page <laughs> that's a hard one it is hard. it's really hard but I think I think ultimately you start to realize after writing, um, I think I probably, I don't remember the, all the, I don't remember if it's a thousand words or I don't remember what your, what the writing thing is, it's right. just a page. Um, but I yeah. think I had double that when I first started writing it. And then I started sort of like wood shedding, right? Just sort of like, eh, they don't really need to know that. And, um, okay, I can make this, I can take these, you know, five sentences and condense them into one thing. So, right. um, so yeah, I mean, it's, again, it's just another form of expression, right? Of being able to tell your story in a way that's compelling, but um, doesn't overwhelm your reader. <laughs> yeah. I, yes, that's great advice for people who are looking to apply uh, to mm -hmm. the essay contest this year. And something else that we, we discuss in kind of the guidelines or recommendations is focusing on your unique story. So what makes you unique? And obviously, in my opinion, Julia, your story is incredibly unique, but you also had to choose certain parts of it. I, I assume that, like, you know, your story is very long and it has lots of different parts, but how were you able to choose what was most unique and what would be most um, exciting for readers to connect with? To know. Um, gosh, that's an excellent question. I think... Um, I think uh, for me, it's, first of all, it's, it's the point that I'm trying to make, right? If I have my, if I know the point that I'm trying to make to my audience, then I can get myself from point A to, to point B, which is what I want you to understand about me and what I want you to, what I wanted my readers and, and, and audience members to understand about me, um, A is, is that, you know, I'm, um, I'm committed to this connection between the culture that I grew up in and what has now become my essentially my adopted home in the world. Um, and and B, I happen to be an opera singer. Um, and there are not, to my knowledge, many Western opera singers doing singing this music out there. I know that there are others who there are pop singers, lots of pop singers, um, and wonderful pop singers at that. Uh, but not very many or anyone. Um, other than people like myself who came out of the program, um, but I'm the one who really kind of took it and just ran with it. And um, and so yeah, it boils down to you know what is the what do I want the audience to know about me, and then what are the most interesting things, right? What what can everybody relate to? Because I think um, it, it is a unique story, and yet, as you said, and yet there are points that hopefully everybody can understand at some point in their life, whether it's whether it's being um, an older learner of Chinese, which I consider myself to be because I learned it way past the sort of like optimal window for learning languages, right? And I'm still learning it and it's I keep wishing that I could just go back in time <laughs> and start my Chinese language learning about like 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, right. 
uh, so so yeah, once once you can find those points, once you know the point you're trying to make, and then of course how you know you can reach the most people reading, um, those are the mm -hmm. points that you end up focusing on in, in an essay such as this. Yeah. Thank you for, for the, that insight. And to, to continue on your point about being, um, starting at an older age, we, mm -hmm. I don't know, if, um, you saw, but we spoke to Camilla last week, uh, Camilla Carter, who was one of our 2018 honorees, and she was in sixth grade when she submitted her essay. Mm -hmm. Um, and now freshman in high school, she started learning Mandarin Chinese in kindergarten. Um, <laughs> But I'd love to hear your perspective because one of the things that we're trying to encourage is all different types of learners, whether you've learned through an academic sense or through a professional sense. So maybe you can encourage people who, who might not think that they can apply, but, but might want to, um, who have worked in that professional sense and like what your, how learning Chinese through opera has happened. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, so please, Please correct me if I'm in, incorrect yes. with, from with what I what I'm remembering about this application process, which is that you the, the Confucius Institute is not looking for fluent speakers of Chinese to apply for this. You are looking for somebody who is passionate in whatever form that is about Chinese culture and passionate about helping to make these connections, whether that's through language or through music or through food, or through art, or through whatever, or mathematics, or whatever, you know, whatever right. connection you're in. Of course, I always talk about the artistic side, because that's what that is the most familiar to me. But I mean, yeah, there are certainly people I've met in China who live in China, or Americans living in China, who went over there because of business, but it was, and it, so business mm -hmm. was their introduction. But then ultimately, it was, you know, it was the culture that that kept them there. So, um, so in terms of, yeah, the, the application process um, and what people should be focusing on is, again, um, I think anybody can, anybody who has shown and, and committed to themselves to this, to this process of learning, um, I think I'm a huge lover of languages. I speak a number of languages and I use them. I mean, my, my every day is spent in three or four different languages. So, um, I appreciate the, the kind of anxiety that language learning can bring to people of all ages, myself included, as I'm preparing for these upper level exams in, in Chinese. Um, I, you know, kind of just, feel like sometimes banging my head against the wall but um but I don't think that that should be a deterrent in fact if I think people like me who like that challenge in their life and um of course right now you know there are so many challenging aspects of everybody's lives this is one challenging aspect of my life that I can control I can control how much right. time I spend studying I can control I can't control my memory that would be a, a really good thing if I could do that <laughs> Um, but I can control the amount of time that I'm spending devoting to this. And, um, you know, my son is, my son just turned, uh, 11, did just turn, but is 11. And, uh, we started Chinese this, this year. I am his teacher. Um, and, uh, because I know that for his generation, this is going to be one of the, if not the most important other language in the world that he, he will be up against in terms of, uh, you know, looking for a job in his future. Um, and because um, through no, no fault of their own, but you know, this was language acquisition was not something that was discussed in my household as a child. So um, to me, it's, it's a great gift to be able to give a child, whether it's your own or somebody else that you know, or a family member. And it's a great gift investment in yourself because I, speaking from my own personal experience, it just has opened up so many things for me. That's wonderful. I love that you're passing it on to your son and um, also along to lots of other people who are, who are reading your book. Do you want to talk about your book and just let people know about it? Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, uh, let me grab it off the shelf, actually. <laughs> Hold on just a second. 
we have a published author who's an honoree now. It's very yeah. exciting. Oh my goodness. This has been an exciting year. Huh? Um, but it was, <laughs> you know, you can't go anywhere. So you might as well finish your book, right? So um, yeah. so this is, this is it. This is singing in Mandarin, which has been a dream of mine since the first time I went to China in 2011 and had no business wanting to write a book about singing in Mandarin because I had just, you know, I had like this much knowledge. Now I have like this much knowledge, um, <laughs> but, but I, but I have been, I have been, you know, um, I mean, my, my language skills have increased so profoundly since my first time there. Um, and it was really important to me that, that Mandarin be represented in the same way that all the other languages are represented in singing. Um, this book is not about learning to speak Mandarin. It's about learning to sing in Mandarin. And um, opera singers, especially in, in North America, North American co conservatories, even European conservatories, take um, what we call diction courses, right? Which is allowing you to learn how to speak the language. You, you sang in choirs, you sang right. in all those languages. You didn't learn to speak those languages, but you learned enough to learn how to pronounce those languages so that when you sang it, you sounded as if you could speak those languages, right? right. Um, my, my personal preference as an opera singer is that I don't like to sing in languages that I don't speak because I want to be able to have a really strong connection to the words that I'm singing. Um, and Mandarin didn't have this sort of diction representation. And it's hard because, of course, the country is so big. There are so many differences between northern and southern pronunciation, eastern and western. Um, and, of course, everybody, just like Italian, and I can say that because I'm Italian, <laughs> Italians also believe that, you know, their pronunciation is the correct pronunciation. Well, Mandarin speakers also believe that, too. Um, but how can we take it and distill it in a way that, allows um, many more people an inroad to to learning it. And again, um, music, you know, there, there have been so many studies on how music helps the learning process for, for everything, regardless of, you know, what subject we're talking about. So why not use singing in Mandarin to help you help guide you through your language learning process? That's so exciting. I will definitely have to take a look. Where can people get it? Um, well, it's uh, our publisher is Roman and Littlefield, Ro, R-O-W-M-A-N and Littlefield.com or Amazon. I think it's on all the Amazon, like internationally. So if you just Google singing in Mandarin, um, you'll, you should be able to find it. Look for my name and my, and my co-writer is Catherine Chu. And, um, yeah, you can order it to your home or even to your iPad. I believe it comes in a, it comes in a, or a Kindle version. So you don't, you yeah. don't have to, you don't have to kill a tree to, to buy it either. <laughs> <laughs> That's so amazing. So, for, so one final question. I know mm -hmm. that, um, you have gone through this entire process as an honoree virtually, um, uh, this time mm -hmm. because of the pandemic, but, would you would you recommend some people applying and um, trying to win this competition to become oh. an honoree? Oh yeah, I mean it's just you know it's um, I was so so just honored to to be in on to be asked to to submit last year and then also to to actually learn that I had been um, selected as one of the honorees. Um, you know who doesn't like to be acknowledged for the efforts that they put in. Um, and of course the Confucius Institute, all of you at the Confucius Institute have been so welcoming and so um, it's, it is a celebration of, of, of cultural exchange. And I'm, I encourage anybody, especially encourage people who say like, hmm, maybe not this year, maybe next year, because Truthfully, you know, wherever you think you are in your language learning process or even your cultural understanding process, I bet I bet you have a really interesting story to tell. And I'm sure it's something that a lot of people would relate to. Thank you so much for those kind words. And I also would agree. We want to hear everybody's stories. Everybody's perspective is really important. And um, I personally love hearing stories from people who might not feel comfortable telling their stories because I'm definitely one of those people. Uh, so, and I, I relate. And so we, the staff are some of the people who are reading the essays and we want to hear your story. So, um, 
And anyone who wants to apply, you can go to www.ciuscenter.org backslash 2021 award or go to the link in our bio. Um, and yeah, please, please apply and let uh, DM us if you need any any extra information. Um, Juliet, thank you so much for joining us and, and taking time out of your day. I know you're very busy and um, we're so excited to have you here. Thanks, Karina. I'm so sorry for the time. I mean, it's not my fault <laughs> that the time changed. What can I say? But, um, but thanks for your flexibility in, in making this happen. And uh, yeah, looking forward to connecting with you again soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye.